Hey, we are in week two of our series called Swipe Right, conversations about sex, dating, and marriage. Some of you knew this already. Some of you didn't know this. And so you might be surprised and excited. You might be like, oh, crap, what did I walk into? Um, but before we get into the hard stuff or before we get into the important stuff or the stuff that you want to know about, I want to talk about a kid, a childhood fairy tale. Uh, raise your hand really quick if you remember the story of Goldilocks and the Three Bears. Okay, that's like the majority of people. Pretty good. Awesome. All right, Goldilocks and the Three Bears, right? So the story goes, if you're unfamiliar with this little fairy tale, there's this girl. Well, actually, it starts really with this family of three bears. Mother bear, like a mama bear, papa bear, and then like, a, I don't know, baby bear or child bear. I don't remember what they call the baby bear. Um, but apparently, like, mama bear makes, like, porridge, which is, a, I think, a version of oatmeal without seasoning and, and um, without any sugar, or without anything. It's just weird. But she makes this porridge, and it comes out of the oven, like, and it's too hot or off the stove, and it's too hot, and they decide, well, rather than, like, reasonably wait for five minutes and let it cool down, we're going to go take a walk. Um, and so they decide they're going to go take a walk, leave their house, apparently unlocked, because this little blonde-haired girl named Goldilocks is strolling through the woods, just kind of, like, rolling, uh, looking for things to get into, including other people's houses. And so she finds this house and decides that she's going to go walk in into this house, uninvited. Um, she's going to break and enter into this home and see what it's all about. She walks into the bear's house and notices that there are three plates of porridge or three bowls of porridge uh, there, apparently, for her taking. And so she tries uh, the first one, um, and it was somehow too cold. She tries the second one, and somehow it was too hot. She tries the third bowl of porridge, and it was just right. Just right. How is that possible? I don't know. They all came off the stove at the same time. They all went for a walk, and somehow one is too cold, one is too hot, one is too or just right. But she doesn't stop with the porridge and eating other people's food. She decides she's going to try their chairs. She wants to make herself at home and get comfortable, break in the furniture. You've already broken into the house, so you might as well break in the furniture. And so she gets into the chairs, and so she sits in the one chair, but it's Papa Bear's chair, but it's, it's too hard. And then she sits in Mama Bear's chair, but it's too soft. And then she sits in Baby Bear's chair, and it's just right until she breaks it. It was just right. It fit, and then she broke it and said, well, I've already broken the furniture, and I'm not comfortable yet, so let me go try the beds. And so she goes to the bedrooms, and she lays on, they all three have separate beds because this is like, 100 years ago, and it wasn't appropriate for her husband and wife to be sleeping together. Uh, and so they have different beds. And so she tries Papa Bear's bed, and it's, again, too hard. Mama Bear's bed, and it's too soft. But then she tries Baby Bear's bed, and it's, you're getting the hang of it. Yeah, like it's just right. And there she lies, ends up falling asleep until the bears come back home and find that their porridge has been eaten, their chairs have been broken, and there's a blonde girl sleeping in their kid's bed. She dashes out of the house, and the bears go on to live happy ever after is basically how the story is. Now, there's a lot of discussion about, like, the meaning of this story and this fairy tale uh, and, you know, all these things. I don't know what they are. I really don't care. The reason I bring it up, though, is because I don't know how much this fairy tale, what type of role it's played on our society and culture, um, but I do feel like there, it's apropos for this topic of, like, dating and, and kind of um, ultimately finding the one. Because we live in a culture and a society where it's like you got to have to, you know, you got to find the one. You got to look for the one. You got to meet the right one. And, and in a lot of ways, there's like, well, this one's, um, he's too, you know, she's too tall. He's too short. Shout out to my short kings. Um, and, 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 and this one is just right. Or she's like this. He's like that, but this one is just right. And we've kind of taken this Goldilocks philosophy when it comes to finding love or experiencing or engaging in, in a dating relationship or in partnership or in, in connecting with another person. And we kind of go on these like, you know, pursuits looking for the one, hoping to find the one. And this kind of idea and this sense is this philosophy has become something that we've adopted in our way of living and in our way of dating, and in our way of sharing and giving love to another person. And it's deeply embedded in, in, in our culture, and we are really have kind of become gripped by this idea of finding the one or finding the right one. And, 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 and we've kind of become fascinated with it. In fact, I, I did this twice just to make sure I wasn't lying um, on two different computers and two different IP addresses. Um, but if you do a Google search, just type in finding the one, you will find over 24 
billion, with a B, 24 billion, 710 million links populated in 0.35 seconds. I did it twice. 24 billion plus search results. That means the likelihood of you finding an actually helpful article about finding the one is three times more difficult than you actually finding the one on a planet of 8 billion people. Like, think about that for a second. 24 plus, nearly 25 billion search results on finding the one. And once this sermon goes online, we'll add to it and make it 24 billion, 710 million and one on finding the one. Clearly, this matters to us. Clearly, there is something that we care about or there's this sense or conviction even that there is one out there for me or that there is one out there for you. And so we look and we search and we commit and we spend money and time and resource and energy and faith and dedicate prayers um, and, 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 and friendships to this conversation or, or asking people, how do I know? I was just, um, I was just in Montana uh, and spent my life as a cowboy for a week. Uh, like literally just got back on Friday and I was fishing and shooting guns and, you know, doing cool stuff and, um, you know, I got to be a boy for a week, and so that was fun. Um, but we went fishing, and, and uh, we were with our guide, and our guide was 23 years old. He's been dating a girl for, for seven months. And so my, uh, my partner, uh, Sean, he, he kind of like, he's like, hey, watch this, and he kind of like winks at me. And he, and he says, hey, uh, so tell me about your girlfriend. And he's like, oh, you know, being good, serious, you know, seven months. And he's like, so, wow, that's seven months. That's pretty serious, you know. How are you feeling about it? He's like, I feel pretty good most days. And, he, and he's like, yeah, that's good. He's like, so, uh, you know, is she the one? Are you thinking she's the one? And he's like, I don't know, like 70%, 80% confident in that. And he's like, yeah, what about that 20%? What about? And, he, and, he, and then we kind of, you know, went into a more serious thing where it's like, hey, listen, you're 23 years old. Like, let's kind of, Sean's like 55, married for 30 plus years. You know, he just wanted to kind of give this guy a hard time because he's the same age as his kids. But like, there's this kind of sense, right? Like, oh, like, hey, is that the one? The one you're with, is, is he the one? Is she the one? And, and while this idea of finding the one, um, you know, plays well for, for movies and novels, um, and, and it certainly tugs at our hearts, and it, and it kind of um, feeds into this desire that we all have for love and, and, and shared experience and shared community and partnership, I, I think this approach or this desire or this commitment or this focus on finding the one can actually lead to a whole array or host of problems that most people are either ill-equipped to deal with or unaware that they'll have to deal with. And then here's what I mean. I'll, I'll kind of give you a few examples, right? When it comes to the problems with this mindset or this kind of ideology of like, the one is out there. I have someone out there. There is one person on this planet for me, and I am one person for them, there's several problems, and here's kind of an example. There's pressure that it creates, right? There's a level of pressure that you experience where you think, well, maybe there is only one person out there for me. In a world of 8 billion plus people, only one of them is for me, and I am for them. Now, I'm, I'm no statistician, and so I can't even fathom or, or begin to comprehend what type of statistical probability would be needed for that to be the case. But that does create an immense amount of pressure. Well, what if I live in the wrong country? What if the one for me lives in another part of the planet? What if the one for me is somewhere where I'll never be? What if, what if I'm with someone, but they're not the one? And it creates this level of, of sense like, you don't want to screw it up, right? Because that's a lot of pressure. Like, I don't want to get this. I don't want to commit because what if they're not the one? I don't want to be committed because the one could be somewhere else. And so it creates this level of pressure that you wrestle with or that you feel and that you experience and that you, you struggle to kind of reconcile when it comes to finding or, or engaging in a relationship with a significant other, and so you feel like, well, I don't know that I've met the one. So then what happens is you keep looking for the one and you keep looking for someone until they become the one or until something in your gut or your spirit or your heart says, he's the one or she's the one, they're the one. This is the one that I'm supposed to be with. So pressure becomes a problem, which then, of course, leads to expectations. And then there's these expectations. Well, like everything will go right once I find the right one. Where are my married people at? You agree? Hey, hey, hey. Yeah. They're the 
right one. Uh, everything's going to go right. Uh. These expectations, well, if I find the right one, everything in my life will be right. When I find the right one, everything's going to go right. So then the problem then becomes, right, well, you thought you married the right one. You thought you committed to the right one. So then when something goes wrong, inevitably what you think is, well, maybe they're not the right one. And so maybe someone else was the right one, and I made a wrong decision. And because your expectations are distorted, your relationship experience gets distorted. Your expectations have a direct correlation to your experience. And so many people have fallen pray to this idea or this sense without even realizing it, that if there is only one person for me, then that must mean that once I find the right one, everything will go right. And listen, everyone that's been married, everyone that's been in a committed relationship, regardless of whether or not you've been married, can tell you not everything is going to go right. But it's not just expectations. Then there creates an insecurity. An insecurity because if, what if I'm the wrong one? If I thought I was with the right one, but the right one isn't happy with me. So am I the wrong one? Am I the wrong one if the right one is unhappy with me? Because they were right for me, but maybe I'm not right for them. I thought they were the right one, and because I thought they were the right one, everything should go right. Well, then maybe I'm the wrong one myself. You know, you hear that story, right? Like you kind of, when there's a problem and there's a a pattern of problems, and maybe you've experienced this in your own relationships, where you balance or you go from relationship to relationship and nothing is clicking and the right one doesn't seem to come along, or you've experienced failed relationships or failed marriages even, and so you think, well, I'm the common denominator, so the problem must be me. I must be the issue. I must be the source of the trouble. And yet, despite these things, we all kind of fall prey to this. And maybe if you've experienced this, or maybe if you've bought into the idea of like just one person or the right one for me, then you've probably experienced one of these three problems, maybe all three of these problems. And yet, despite our recognition or our realization that these things happen, these problems surface when we buy into or feel like it's all about the one and finding the one, despite our understanding that that leads to problems, yet we still pursue it, yet we still subscribe to it, yet we still buy into it, yet we still think for whatever reasons, this is the only way, that there is only this way, that it must be the right one and the only one. And people continue to be consumed with finding the one, despite discouragement, frustration, pressure, unnecessary pressure, unrealistic expectations, unneeded insecurities. But it's okay because I'm here today to tell you, you don't need to chase after the one. And and what I'm here today to offer is maybe some contrarian, maybe even some controversial bit of advice when it comes to the one. And I don't care if you're married. I don't care if you're dating. I don't care if you're in a committed relationship. I don't care if you're remarried. I don't care if you're divorced. I don't care if you're not looking or you are looking. What I have to offer to you today is something that will lead you to what I believe will be a healthier, more fruitful, and more impactful, and more connected, and meaningful life, not just for yourself, but for every relationship that you're in. For every relationship you commit to, for every relationship you'll experience, friendship, platonic, or romantic, it won't make a difference. What I have to offer to you are better pursuits than the pursuit of chasing after the one. Not because, well, let me just say this. I think to some degree, the idea or the notion of the one should be completely scrapped, like completely thrown out. Maybe like 80 to 90% of it should be completely thrown out. Because so much of it leads to unhealth. So much of it leads to a false dichotomy and a false belief system and a false way of engaging. And and it's not because the one is, is a bad person or because the one is a bad concept. It's because being consumed with the right one more often than not leads to failure, disappointment, unhealth. And this perpetual cycle of recycling people in your life. And so if you shouldn't be consumed with finding the one, I think there are some things that you should be consumed with. And so what I want to do today is is offer and maybe share this better way, maybe give to you, provide to you three things, three uh, areas or three uh, pursuits that are far more worthy, far far better for you to focus on than the focus of finding the one. 
Now, I know there's probably some people in here who are like, no, I'm sitting next to the one. And that person's like, I don't know if they're the one. Um, don't raise your hand. We'll have prayer and counseling afterwards. You can slide into a DM and say, Ricky, that was me. Um, so this isn't to like sway you or dissuay you of the person that you're with or the person that you're interested in. Rather, this is to offer you a better path forward, one that will lead, as I said, to greater fruitfulness, more prosperity, more blessing, and more significance in your relationships. So with that in mind, I want to share really the first thing you should focus on. And it's simply this, focus on development, not discovery. Development, not discovery. Now, a lot of people, a lot of people look at every person and at each date through the lens of, is this the one? I'm on a first date. Does he have potential? I'm on a second date. Okay, like deciphering things, distinguishing things. And, and, and they kind of look at every engagement as like, is this man, is this woman, is this person the one that I'm supposed to be with? And every hangout is kind of more like an interrogation where you're just kind of asking questions to try to get something and kind of like, you know, sift through all the stuff to see what stands out, what jumps out, what feels fishy or suspicious or curious or uncertain. And, and, and then conversations seem to become kind of more like um, people trying to engineer a perfected future rather than just growing organically together. Which means every question or conversation becomes an attempt to kind of dig something up, bring to the surface what, you know, in many ways, maybe it's because I was just out in Montana, but it feels to me like back in the 1800s when people like went out west trying to like find gold. And they're digging all over the place, trying to mine, trying to sift, trying to find gold. And it's not so much maybe that you have a motivation to find bad, uh, maybe you do, um, but it's like you want to kind of discover something I want to discover the good. I want to discover the bad. I want to see if there's gold here. I want to see if there's value here. I want to see if there's merit here. I want to discover these things. And all they do is pursue discovery of another person and they neglect the development of themselves. But a healthier, more holistic approach, a better approach is to focus on your own personal development to focus on who you are becoming, to focus on what you are doing, to focus on where you're headed and what's happening in your life, um, to, to do the work to strengthen your character, to build your faith, to develop your skills, um, to build your, your connections and your relationship in a meaningful and an impactful way, to develop those areas or those aspects of your life. And I think this matters, or the reason why I feel like this matters is because this is actually what God desires for you. God actually desires for you to be developed. Romans chapter 5, the Apostle Paul wrote this, starting in verse 3. He says, we can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials, for we know that they, notice this, they help us, what's that word? Develop. Let's read it out loud, louder. They help us what? Develop. Develop. Endurance. And endurance, what? Develops. Develops strength of character. And character strengthens our confident hope of salvation. And notice this. This hope will not lead to disappointment. That it is in the process of development that God will lead you to prosperity. It is in the process or in the road of being developed that God will bring you blessing. It is on this path of, of focusing on your own personal and spiritual development that God will lead you to a place where you will not find yourself disappointed regardless of your relationship status. That you can be filled and satisfied and whole as a single person, as a married person, as a divorced person, as a remarried person, as an unsure person. That God's intention and his desire to make you whole is not conditional upon your relationship status on Facebook or who you sleep with at night or who shows up to the dinner table in the evening. That God's intention and desire for you is to be made whole, not for someone else to make you feel whole. And this is massive. Because there are so many people wandering aimlessly through relationships, hoping that someone or something will fill them, that someone or something won't disappoint them, that someone or something will strengthen them. 
And God's word says that it's him, that it's your pursuit of your development, that actually you have that power yourself and instead you're forfeiting it and vacating it to someone else, falsely hoping that they can do it for you, but they can't. See, way too many people focus on finding the one rather than actually become, get this, it's kind of like a tongue twister, another way to say this, okay? Become the one, the one you're looking for is looking for. Too many people are stuck on like, let me find the one. You should instead focus on becoming the one, the one you're looking for is looking for. They're looking for somebody too. And the better approach to say, who am I becoming rather than getting caught up? You see, ironically, when, when, you, when you focus on being developed, you're actually more likely to get discovered. And this is true in relationship. This is true in your career. This is true in life. So many people are like, hey, look at me, pick me, pick me. Let me put this bio. Let me put my, you know, my, my Bumbo photo. I got to get a good one. I got to have, you know, it's, it's, it's me looking cool. It's me looking hot. It's me doing something fun. And maybe that'll make me stand out. Maybe if I pay for the premium version, then I'll be more inclined to get picked. And so many people are caught up on that rather than saying, hey, you want, let me be developed. Let me grow, let me strengthen, let me build. And what I found, like I said, in work, in career, in life, in relationship, when you do that, when you focus on being developed, you'll get discovered. You don't have to worry about that part. So first, focus on development, not discovery. Second, focus on purpose, not pursuit. So much of dating is treated, again, I got Montana on my mind, but it's treated like a wild animal hunt. I was learning about how the natives would herd and attack and like hunt buffalo. Now, I hope you don't do this in dating, but let me tell you what happens. What they would do is they would kind of um, like chase after these buffalo on horseback and kind of try to like pin them and corner them to a cliff's edge. And as they kind of like felt the pressure of the herd kind of pushing against um, the back line of, of, of buffalo or bison, um, like the, the pressure that was kind of like moving against them was just too much. And so inevitably, like buffalo and bison would fall off the cliff down to their death. But at the bottom, get this, they would send the women and the kids to get them. The women and the kids would be down there waiting for these buffalo to fall off the cliffs so that they had something to eat. And so they would chase these buffaloes across expansive miles and territory, um, hoping to kind of pin them into this region or into this area. And yet so many people, maybe not to kill someone, uh, hopefully, um, but you're, you're kind of like trying to corner someone like, I got you. I found you. Here you are. Here I am. We're in this together. Not only is that weird and oppressive, but needless to say, it's unhealthy and probably ineffective. And yet, people are on this endless pursuit, searching for the one. Maybe if I go here, they'll be there. Maybe if I do this, she'll be there. Maybe if I act like this, he'll be interested. Maybe if I wear this, they'll take note. Maybe if I talk like this, they'll think I'm cool. Maybe if I show up to this church, they'll be there. And so it's like we kind of pinball our way through life, maybe hoping that we land somewhere and hit the goal. And when that doesn't work, they try the next tactic or the next strategy or the next recommendation from the book or the TikTok video or, or you know, the one out of the 24.7 billion articles available online. Just like an endless goose chase. And the problem with this is that before you know it, when you're so committed and so focused on the pursuit of the one, before you know it, what you end up doing is that in the pursuit of the one, you lose yourself. You don't know who you are. You don't know what you're here for. You don't know what God wants for you. Why? Because you've been so concerned about what that other person wants or what you think they want or who you think they want. And so you run after that. And again, we're warned and advised against this. Proverbs 19.21 says this, you can make many plans, but it's the Lord's purpose that will prevail. 
You can make your plans. Okay, I'm going to show up to this event. I'm going to go to this speed dating thing. I'm going to go uh, to this outing. I'm going to show up to this church. I'm going to, by this age, I'm going to find the one, da 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 and make my plans. I'm going to wear this wedding dress. I'm going to, you know, have my bachelor party in this place. And all these things, you can make all the plans you want, but ultimately it's the Lord's purpose that prevails, which means it's far more important, far greater for us to be consumed and concerned with God's purposes for our lives than it is to be consumed or concerned by the pursuit of another person. So your focus and your intention should be dedicated to first figuring out who you are, why you're here. Because listen, get this, this is true for everyone. I don't care if you're 11 years old or 111 years old. God has purpose for you. You have been put here on purpose. He has significance marked over your life. He has spoken it and declared it and promised it. And he has authorized it and released you to take hold of it. He has purpose for you. And so you should be focusing, why am I here, God? Who are you in my life? What is it that you desire to do in me, through me, with me, and for me? And focus on that. And listen, you say, well, Ricky, I don't know what my purpose is. I don't know what I'm here. Let me give you a plug. We preached a series a couple summers ago called Finding Your Purpose. A great series, an explicit series, very practical series that helped our church navigate through the steps and the paths needed to discover and step into your purpose. So if you're like, hey, that sounds like something I could benefit from, then grab your connection card or fill out the digital one and just write somewhere on that card, purpose. And I'll send you a link this week with all the sermons. I won't spam you. I'll send you a link with the sermons on video and on audio podcast so that you can listen and step into the things that God has for you. Because listen, as you run toward your purpose, what you will find is that you'll find yourself running alongside of those who are also pursuing their purpose. And I'm certainly no marriage expert, but this summer, believe it or not, I've been married 17 years to my wife. Every time I say that, the claps and the applause get a little bit better. It's like it becomes a little bit more impressive. Like, oh, okay. So uh, that, that one actually felt good. Sometimes a bit defeated. Like, oh, nobody cares. 17 years, most of them happy ones. And I say that jokingly, but I say that seriously. And yet what's interesting is in the midst of the happy ones and the unhappy ones, what has kind of binded us together and kept us together is that we have this shared purpose. And it is our purpose that has kept us through the seasons of life where we were literally on the brink of divorce or where it seemed like or felt like divorce was the only option and that we made a mistake and married the wrong one. It has been that shared purpose that has kept us together, that has led us forward and has brought us to this place where we stand before you and we minister and we serve and we love and we're unified in heart, spirit, and purpose. And the same could be true for you, that as you pursue your purpose, what you'll find as you focus on that, you'll find yourself running this race called life and that the people of interest to you and the people who are interested in you are actually going to be running alongside of you. And it'll give you greater clarity and greater confidence. And let's be honest, practically, it'll save you a lot of heartache and time. So pursue your purpose, not the pursuit of another person, Let me give you this third path. Focus on convictions, not compromise. Convictions, not compromise. On this journey of dating and love, man, it is so easy. And let me just say, so easy. Easy to settle. The temptation, the inclination, to settle, to lower your standards, to kind of give in a little bit, ease your expectations, uh, maybe lower the bar and ultimately compromise on who you are, what you believe in, or the values that you have. Both the temptation and the desire on this journey, I understand, will increase. As time goes on, as the feelings of loneliness persist, as the desire for love and companionship only continues to increase. And inevitably, you'll be faced with opportunities, plural, opportunities to compromise, to settle for less 
than what God desires to, to kind of just take, if you put it this way, to take whatever it is that you can get. But let me say this because you all need to hear this. Love, committed love, committed relationships. It's not like showing up at the school lunch line and just taking whatever they give you. This is not that. That is not God's desire, nor is that God's ideal for you. This is about honoring God, and this is about honoring the other person. And there is no need or no reason to just kind of lower the standards out of desperation or out of fear or out of worry that maybe if I don't do this now, if I don't buckle up or settle down or land someone, that I'm going to be like this for the rest of my life. I've already illustrated and shown you that God has the ability to fulfill you with hope and purpose and significance that will not lead to disappointment regardless of who is by your side. So there's no need to lower this. As a follower of Jesus, and more importantly, let me just say this to those of us who are committed to Jesus, in this context, more importantly, as a daughter or a son of God, you are today already fully loved, fully accepted, fully found, and fully welcomed in. There is nothing any other person on this planet can add to those things in God's eyes. There is nothing any other person on this planet can take away from those things in God's eyes. Those are four absolute truths. And God says, listen, because of that, you do not have to settle or compromise. Instead, stand on your convictions. This is what we're instructed. Romans chapter 12, verse 2 says, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world. Don't become like everyone else to get what everyone else does. Let's be honest. If you were to just kind of paint with a broad brush at the majority of the relationships that you know, chances are, you would feel like, ah, I don't know that I want that. And yet, we're willing to make the same decisions that lead to that, that lead to that place of unhealth or a lack of desirability. But God says, let God transform you. That word transform, by the way, is the Greek word meta. Let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think then you will learn to know God's will for you. In other words, you will learn to know what God wants. The conviction will stand there, which is good and pleasing and perfect. Now, I want to take a moment to speak specifically to two people groups. I want to speak first to the women. I've been married 17 years. I got married at the age of 21. I'll be 38 this summer. Very honestly, I do not know what it's like to date. I don't. I am wholly and entirely ill-equipped and unfamiliar. You should be grateful because I've been married 17 years. It'd be really awkward if I'm like, well, I've been married 17 years, but let me tell you, my dating experiences over the past 17 years have been like, nah, that ain't there. But here's what I know based off of what people in our church, people outside of our church have told me about dating, women specifically, about dating men, particularly here in this city. It's incredibly difficult. And difficult is the kindest way that I can put it. It is disheartening. It is disgusting. At times, it is atrocious and so vile when I hear from women how they are approached by men, how they are spoken to by men. how they are treated like a garment or a, a piece of material that is used for pleasure and gratification and then quickly discarded when something else comes along or simply because that's what they wanted to do. And while I am unequipped and unfamiliar with dating itself, um, I'm familiar with the challenges that you face. And I want you to know, uh, there's a lot of people in this room and I can't see everyone's eyes and I can't look, and this is true for all women regardless of your relationship status, that you are so highly valued by God, that you are cherished 
in him, that he is infatuated with you, who you are, your spirit, your being, your personality, all of you. He loves you. In fact, he loves you so much that he was willing to give himself for you, to sacrifice. And here's what you need to know about God, our Father. He is a gentleman at his core. He will not force himself upon you. He will not manipulate you or twist you into action. He will not abuse you. He will not leave you feeling shameful. He will not destroy your spirit and make you think that you are unworthy. He will not take advantage of you. He will not mistreat you. And you shouldn't let any other guy do the same. You are beyond worthy. And any man who is unwilling or unable to recognize that, I'll say this very explicitly, is not worth you. Not your time. He's not worth you. Leave. Walk away. Pay no interest. You don't need that. And he doesn't deserve that. Now to the men, I don't know you, I don't know all your dating history, I don't know your actions or or, or, or that, but let me just speak. I'm not going to beat up on guys because that's usually what happens, right? The women this and then guys are going to get punished. And maybe you deserve to be punished, but I'll do that privately. (laughs) Maybe I deserve to get punished. But to the men, let's be men. Let's be mature. Let's be honoring. Let's be dignifying. Let's be loving. Let's be gentle. Let's reflect who God is. Everything I just said about God, let's be that to the best of our ability to the women in our lives, siblings, daughters, parents, uh, romantic interests, coworkers, and colleagues. Why is it that we feel like we should be childish in our engagements with women and expect them to respect us? I thought I'd get an amen from the women. But seriously, let's be men. Let's be men that stand before God and God says, well done. Well done, good and faithful servant. Well done, my son. You've lived and reflected my heart for all people and my daughters. Your convictions matter, men and women. And standing on these convictions makes a difference. In fact, I'll say it this way, if you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything. Your values, your morals, your standards. If you don't, yeah, I ripped it from Hamilton. I see a a couple people laughing. I I did. Look, truth is everywhere, baby. You got to pull from whatever you can get. (laughs) But if you don't stand for something, you're going to fall for anything. And when you fall for anything, you'll find yourself feeling crushed, heartbroken, and dispirited. So there you have it. My thoughts, my treaties, if you will, on the one and finding the one. In fact, I think you should stop expending so much energy and time and resource on finding the one and instead focus on your development, not the discovery of another person, your purpose, not the pursuit of another person, and your convictions, not compromising to be accepted by another person. And I know this isn't easy, I know there's a lot of challenge in this, and I know that this poses a a bit of complication in how we go about our lives. And it can feel discouraging. You're like, well, Ricky, I'm great. You got married at 21, but I'm way past that. And no interest, no prospects on the horizon, no roster to look at. And it's discouraging, and it feels like God's not listening. This is a deep desire that I have, and God's not responding. Or maybe you feel like I'm in a relationship with someone, and it's kind of dicey. It's not easy right now. Things aren't optimized and things aren't going great and it doesn't feel like we're gelling or on the same page. And that poses a whole other set of challenges and frustrations and, 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 and issues. But I wanted to share just kind of one scripture as maybe a sort of benediction and, and encouragement to close. It comes from the book of Hebrews, chapter 10, verse 36. And the writer says this, patient endurance is what you need now so that you will continue to do God's will 
And then notice this. Then you will receive all that he has promised. Patient endurance. No matter your circumstance, no matter your status, no matter your relationship situation, patient endurance is what you need now so that you will continue to do God's will. And then you will receive all that God has promised. God wants us to thrive in relationships. God wants relationships to be an added value, something that overflows into us as we overflow into others. And his word says that if we're willing to run this race with patient endurance and continue to do what he's called us to do, to live the way he's called us to live, that he will reward us and the promise will be found. So with that, I want to take a moment to pray for us. I'm going to invite the team to come back up. We're going to come back to a song that we sang earlier, a song called King of My Heart that Asia led us in. And I asked the team to to kind of revisit this song rather than speak or sing another song because I felt like this is an appropriate declaration for today, for a message like this. I love my wife, would do anything, would lay down, literally would lay down my life for her. And the reason why I do that is not because she's the king or the queen of my heart. The reason I would do that is because Jesus is the king of my heart and Jesus laid down his life for me. And so as we sing this song, I want to invite you to kind of make it your own declaration and a recognition, again, regardless of your relationship status, your age, your position, whatever it might be, to declare that Jesus is the king of your heart and that he's good. So with that, I'm asking you to stand to your feet. I'm going to pray for us, and then we'll turn it over to the team. Lord, today, God, I thank you. I thank you, Lord, that in our lives and in this world, you have something greater for us than this pursuit of finding the one. That you have something, a direction, a path for us that will lead us to greater fruitfulness and and meaning and significance and that all of that will not be dependent or conditional upon who we are with or, or who's by our side. But Lord, I also thank you that you do provide people in our lives and for our lives. You provide people who bring us hope and joy and significance and add to the purpose that we have. And in this moment, I just want to pray over anyone maybe that feels like heartbroken or defeated. I don't know, maybe you would say you feel desperate in this area or just kind of like you've given up because you're just tired of hoping and praying and believing that someone is available to you or for you, and, and, and it seems like God's not listening. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands or anything like that. I just want to pray over you. And so if that's you, you can just acknowledge to yourself, you don't need to look at me, you don't need to say anything to me, you don't need to raise a hand, but just there where you're standing, you can say, God, that's me. Yeah, that's me. So Father, I pray over anyone who has made that confession anyone who has acknowledged or recognized that they're just feeling worn out on this path or on this road or feeling like empty or alone and they're just like you're not, maybe they feel like you're not responding or that you don't care, that you just kind of moved on from them. Everyone else seems to be getting married, finding the one, amount of money I've spent going to a wedding or being in a wedding or Sending cards or gifts for weddings is like just frustrating and discouraging. And I know, God, for both women and men, that is an incredibly vulnerable place to be. So I pray now, Lord, that you would just minister into their heart, that you would show some evidence or sign of comfort and care and concern that you see them, that you care about them, and that your promise of blessing and purpose is actually for them. Lord, I pray as we step toward these paths, whether it's purpose or our development or solidifying our personal convictions, pray, God, that you would be honored 
and that in return you would honor us. We pray these things, Jesus, the King of our hearts. Amen.